today i am presenting the discussion on physiology paper 1 of first mbbs conducted by dr ntr uhs held on 2nd february 2022 these multiple choice questions i am discussing are taken from set a paper i have not edited the grammatical aspect of the questions they are taken as they are presented or as they are printed in the question paper mostly i have referred genong's textbook of physiology or guitens medical physiology in addition i have referred other books like respiratory physiology cardiovascular physiology and samson rights physiology and they are mentioned wherever they have been referred friends i would request you to subscribe to my channel to get new updates as well as leave your comments in the box so that i can address or i can reply back or i can give my point of view also if you want to discuss any new question please leave the question in the box with this i will proceed to the question number 1 the medullary stage of hemopoiesis starts at fifth month of fetal life option b seventh month of fetal life option c ninth week of fetal life option d after birth it is seen that from the embryo in the embryonic yolk sac level to the hepatic stage from the hepatic stage to the bone marrow stage uh, takes time usually the hepatic stage is reaching its peak or almost reaching its peak or end somewhere around fifth month of gestation so fifth month of gestation the the bone marrows start developing and at this age the bone marrows uh, start manufacturing the myeloid series of the leukocytes to start with then after that the erythroid series they will start somewhere in the mid of gestation as i have read in samson rights now looking at that we look in the answer answer to this question is option a fifth month of fetal life because here the williams hematology they have mentioned that the production of erythrocytes in this chapter the bone marrow begin to form on fifth month and is ready for manufacturing that is one point and the second point the gaiten and hall mentions that the during the last month or so the gestation of gestation and after birth red blood cells are produced exclusively in the marrow and samson right mentions that in the mid pregnancy the bone marrow starts functioning to synthesize erythroid series considering these aspects it is known that the myeloid series begin to form in the beginning from the marrow and uh, the most appropriate answer for this question is fifth month of fetal life i have given the references here going on to the next question this is a very simple straight forward question the iron deficiency anemia is 
मैक्रोसाइटिक ऑप्शन ए मैक्रोसाइटिक हाइपोक्रोमिक ऑप्शन बी माइक्रोसाइटिक हाइपोक्रोमिक ऑप्शन सी द नार्मोसाइटिक हाइपोक्रोमिक ऑप्शन डी नार्मोसाइटिक नार्मोक्रोमिक यस वी ऑल नो द आयन डेफिशिएंसी एनीमिया प्रोड्यूसेस माइक्रोसाइटिक हाइपोक्रोमिक एनीमिया here i would like to explain a phenomena why they become microcytes why they become hypochromic we are very clear that it is hypochromic because there is no hemoglobin that is why it is hypochromic that is simple since there is no hemoglobin there is no osmotically active substance within the cell the cell size reduces the cell size uh, because of the hemoglobin you we have a very good uh, large quantity of hemoglobin there in each cell so maybe you so you know that uh, the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration uh, that that constitute the concentration is somewhere around the 30% so in that way you have that particular thing is decreasing for that reason the osmotic activity decreases the cell size diminished because to accommodate because usually the osmotic pressure of the uh, hemoglobin that fills up the the rbcs that is just a, uh, an added information I, i would like to say question number 3 which of the following chemical is not released from dense granules of platelets option a adp option b fibronectin option c serotonin option d calcium before i give the answer to this question i read the text described by genong in his book on page 74 the dense granules which contain the non protein substances that are secreted in response to platelet activation including the substances including serotonin adp and other adenine nucleotides having read this thing we have a adp here we have serotonin here and in this genong they don't they don't have a mention of the calcium so now the non protein non protein substances fibronectin is a protein a lamellar protein of the cell and hence this is not the protein is not contained in the dense granules that is for sure the second part the calcium usually calcium is present in the ribosomes or in the endoplasmic reticulum now the calcium how it is stored in the dense granules maybe as a part of default some indian authors they describe calcium but uh, in uh, gaitan or genong you will not find a calcium in this and i see calcium uh, is stored in the ribosome and endoplasmic reticulum that is why i have put the question mark but i would give uh, the uh, option b as a correct response however the calcium has to be chucked uh, perfectly now moving on moving on to the next question question number 4 in clotting mechanism via intrinsic and extrinsic pathway the key reaction is option a formation of thrombin option b formation of fibrin option c formation of prothrombin activator option d conversion of factor 10 to 10e to consider this question number 4 i have just here borrowed a diagram from described from genong's review of medical physiology and this diagram is there in many textbooks so this is the intrinsic pathway and this is the extrinsic pathway this is the intrinsic pathway and this is the extrinsic pathway and this intrinsic pathway starts with the activation of a factor 12 by the kinonogens and calicrine and then 11 to 11a 9 to 9a then with the help of the phospholipids the calcium 8a so this would be 
factor 10 is activated to factor 10a. That is, the 10th is activated. This is the one factor here. In the extrinsic mechanism, you have this, uh, again, it will come, common thing is uh, 10 to 10a. Hence, the option D, conversion of factor 10 to 10a is the response, or a correct response for this. It's a simple question. I have put this um, a pathway for our understanding. So now, to rule out formation of a thrombin, formation of a thrombin is here. This is activated by the 10A. Formation of a fibrin, fibrin is by the thrombin activation of the fibrinogen. Or uh, uh, the formation of a prothrombin activator, this is a prothrombin activator by this uh, the factor fifth and other compounds like this here. So that means they are not in the common. The common, the first common point, uh, turning point is 10 to 10A. The option D is the correct response. This is the uh, Genox reference. Maybe you will find it in many, many uh, books. Going on to question number five, Dicomeral acts by option A, chelating calcium, Option B, inhibiting thrombin activity. Option C, inhibiting plasmin activators. Option D, inhibiting vitamin K. So now the calcium is chelated by EDTA, EGTA, or uh, oxalates. These are things which are the calcium chelators. Antithrombin compounds, they are, uh, they are the specialized pharmacological compounds which are new, new developed. Then antiplasmin, these are serine peptidases. So now these are not there. This is a vitamin K, is a old warfarin-like uh, compound, or the, the uh, vitamin K inhibitor is a warfarin-like compound. And this vitamin, the dichromaral and warfarin, they, they act in a similar way by inhibiting vitamin K. So the correct response is option D, inhibiting vitamin K. And that is what uh, you can uh, you can just uh, be sure this is a clear question. Then question number six. Conduction velocity of a cardiac muscle is highest in which part of the conducting system? This is a very favorite question. And uh, we have the internodal pathways, option A, bundle of his bundle or bundle of his option B. Option C is Purkinje fibers. Option D is bundle branches. Before going to the answer, I would like to say the conduction rate or conduction velocity at a different conducting pathways. SA node is 0 0.05 meters per second. Atrial pathway is one meters per second. AV node is 0 0.05 meters per second. The bundle of is one meters per second. Perkinji system is four meters per second. The ventricular muscle is one meters per second. Looking at this table, the option C, Perkinji fibers, or Perkinji fibers is the correct response. Here, it is four meters per second. This is taken from, you know, simple straightforward uh, question. Ejection fraction of the ventricle refers to ratio of option A, amount of blood received to amount of blood ejected. B, stroke volume to end diastolic volume. C, end systolic volume to end diastolic volume. Then D, option D, stroke volume to end systolic volume. Now, if you are looking at the amount of blood received to amount of blood ejected, so they are almost equal because you cannot have the amount of blood coming to the heart should be equal to the blood going to the heart. Otherwise, there will be a load, ventricular overload, or the where whole the heart becomes filled up. So then this option A is not a correct response. Then you look at the ejection fraction the amount of blood ejected by the ventricles out of the total blood present in the ventricle. Now, stroke volume to end diastolic volume. So that means this is the stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected per 
Then its end diastolic volume is the total amount of blood present in the arctic, uh, uh, in the ventricles. So option B. The option C is the end systolic volume to end diastolic volume. End systolic volume is not, it's, it's a part of the residual fraction. End systolic, after ejecting, what is left in the ventricles is the residual part in reference to the uh, total amount. This is a part of the residual amount which is left in the, uh, in the ventricle. That is a, this part, option C. Option C, option D is a stroke volume to end systolic volume. Stroke volume to end systolic volume. So this is another complex fraction. So now the answer to this question is option B, stroke volume to end diastolic volume. And you will get the reference in many books. And this is what option B for this answer. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to explain in, explain the findings so that uh, uh, our, our students get benefited uh, uh, by the explanations. Now, this is another uh, question, option, question eight. The bradycardia is seen in, option A, beriberi, option B, anemia, option C, myxedema, Option D, Paget's disease. I will put this question in the other format. All of the following conditions increase the hemodynamic circulation, except if you try to understand that particular component. If you are looking at in very, very, there is an increased hemodynamic circulation. And in anemia, there is an increased hemodynamic circulation. And in Paget's disease, increased hemodynamic circulation. And uh, in myxedema, no. But the myxedema is a disease produced by the thyroxine and the T3, T4 deficiency. And these T3, T4 are metabolic activators, they will in enhance the rate of rise of the, the prepotential, especially the prepotential at the sinus, sinoatrial mode. Now, when T3, T4 are deficit, the prepotential, the metabolism is diminished, cellular metabolism is diminished, the rate of rise is becoming slower. Hence, you will see that there is a bradycardia. So the option C, the myxedema is the correct response. The very, very increased hemodynamic circulation, there is tachycardia. Anemia, there is tachycardia. And Paget's disease, you will find there is tachycardia. Move on to question number nine. The common artery involved in cerebral hemorrhage is. This is a very. I, I see the more uh, easy question when we teach about the nervous system, a stroke, we mention about that. So now I read again, the common artery involved in cerebral hemorrhage is one lenticular striate branch of middle cerebral artery. B, the posterior basilar artery. C, anterior cerebral artery. D, the middle meningeal artery. So we know that the circle of Willis is formed by the arteries in which the middle meningeal do not participate. Internal carotid artery, when it joins the circle of Willis, from here two branches arise, one the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. From the posterior basilar artery, we get posterior cerebral arteries. The most frequently the atherosclerotic or anything about a stroke is caused by the middle cerebral artery. Hence, the option lenticular striate branch of a middle cerebral artery. Here, the examiner has put the middle meningeal artery to confuse our students. So now, if you are looking at this lenticular striate branch, that's one of the branch of the middle cerebral artery. We are considering with the middle cerebral artery. This is the most frequent uh, site for uh, the stroke or hemorrhage. 
the option the correct response is option a lenticular right branch of the middle cerebral artery you can find this reference in Titan and Hall on page 780 question number 10 a wave of jugular venous pulse is caused by a option a atrial systole option b ventricular systole option c atrial diastole option d ventricular diastole now if we want to consider now before i tell the answer this is one of the one of the jugular venous pulse the jugular venous pulse have this is a start here to here you have a, a a c v are the positive waves x and y are the descents from here to here that completes one cardiac cycle and this is superimposed here with this ecg wave now this a because the question is a wave of the jugular venous pulse the A wave corresponds with the P wave. This is corresponds with the atrial contraction. You can see that atrial contraction. A wave corresponds with the atrial systole. C wave corresponds with the closure of the tricuspid valve. So if you are looking at this uh, uh, C wave here, you will have the closure of the tricuspid valve. And uh, the X descent is the, is the ventricular systole. And Y or V is the end of a ventricular systole, or it corresponds to the isovolumetric relaxation of the ventricle. Then Y is the, again, it comes back, the ventricular relax, total relaxation, the beginning of the atrial, atrial systole. So now the answer is it's not ventricular systole, it is not atrial diastole, because atrial diastole is coming here in the it's all merged with the Q wave, or it's not ventricular diastole, it is atrial systole, A, C, V, X, Y, I have given, and I have taken this graph from the uh, Levix uh, introduction, uh, introduction to Cardiovascular Physiology, uh, that is the book I have referred, and this is page 143 there, and also it is mentioned in an announced uh, textbook on uh, 492. Question number 11, again another easy question, the surfactant is produced by Option A, type 2 pneumocytes. Option B, type 1 pneumocytes. Option C, macrophages. Option D, endothelial cells. Type 1 pneumocytes participate in the, the ventilation. The type 2 pneumocytes participate in number of uh, non-ventilatory functions of the lung. Of that, the surfactant synthesis is one of them. Surfactant synthesis and even angio-converting angiotensin converting enzyme synthesis and other uh, activities uh, that that is uh, the regulation or uh, doing the uh, activating other uh, proteinous structures of the lung. So that means uh, the answer answer to this question, if you are looking at the surfactant is produced by the correct response is type two pneumocytes. They synthesize the surfactants and uh, the other things, but these macrophages participate in the uh, cellular immunity, maybe the Cooper cells there, and then endothelial cells, they are participating in the perfusion. So these three are not involved. The correct response is option A, type 2 pneumocytes. This is a simple question, and I have given you another thoughts there. That is uh, page 590 of the Genome. Question number 12. Time vital capacity of FVV1 less than 70% in option A, bronchial asthma, option B, bronchitis, option C, the pulmonary fibrosis, option D, the lung collapse. Before that, I would like to take you take you here to the graph. What is this time vital capacity? The previously it was called time vital capacity. Now it is FVV one FVV by FVC FVV one by FVC the post vital capacity ratio. Now this is a normal condition. 
the CFVC is the, the total vital capacity which can be exhaled forcefully, that is 100% or whatever the value. Here it is 5 liters. And uh, FEV in one second, in the first second is 4, so the, it is 80%. Normally it is about 80%. Now, here is an obstructive condition. In this obstructive condition, as in asthma, what happens? Uh, the vital capacity, because if you are looking at the time, maybe three seconds or five seconds, but if you, if you can expire it forcefully for a longer period of time, it may be more, post vital capacity may be more. But in first second, because of the spasm, the bronchiolar spasm, so the amount of air ejected is less, so that you can you will see that a very small fraction, small fraction of the air is present in reference to this total 100%. If you are looking at FEV, that is at the end of a first second, is 1.3, whereas FVC is 3.1, the ratio is about 42%. This is happens in case of a obstructive condition. Now, in the restrictive conditions, what happens? The, it is restricted. That means the amount of air exhaled is, it happens within the, whatever the time interval it has taken here, it will happen here. That will reach the maximum. But, so the first second you may have you, may, you might have exhaled more air or uh, the more or less uh, the normal air or more air. That means 80% or more than 80% of the uh, exhalations. That is uh, uh, here, you just see the example, 3.1 liters, 2.8 liters, it's 90%. These restrictive, uh, restrictive conditions include, include here, if you are looking at a pulmonary fibrosis or a lung collapse or a scoliosis, or any other conditions which restricts uh, these things, even the bronchitis, maybe spasm, or uh, not the spasm, not other, with other conditions. So these restrictive conditions, uh, they will, they will uh, not alter the, the FEV1 FE, FE, FE and FEC ratio. Title it is the obstructive as happens in case of asthma. It is uh, increased or it is decreased so hence, you see that option A is the correct response. The time greater capacity of FEV1 is 70%. The option A is asthma. That's the correct response. You can see this thing in the uh, uh, hall. And uh, this, this one reference, I have taken it from the uh, John West uh, respiratory physiology. OK, now we move on to question number 13. Again, it is referring to the another respiratory question. The ventilation perfusion ratio is maximum at. The ventilation perfusion ratio is maximum at. Option A, apex of lung. Option B, base of lung. Option C, posterior lobe of lung. Option D, middle part of the lung. The problem of this question is in the stem, they should have mentioned ventilation perfusion ratio, ratio is maximum at when in the standing or erect posture. Suppose the person is in the lying down posture, the options may be different. You can just look at that. So anyway, I assume that the person is sitting or standing. In that situation, you just see that this is the lung here. It's in the upright, upright position. When the lung is in the upright position, you see that what happens to these blood vessels. The blood vessels, because there is a, what happens to the hydrostatic column, hydrostatic column decreases here, they are constricted. This circle or this oval uh, thing is, it is alveoli. That means alveoli remaining same. The, this is this thing, what happens to the ratio? because the amount of blood coming is less. So that means uh, ventilation is remaining same, perfusion is less, it should be greater than one. That may be, that is one. And if you are coming here, it is, uh, that is not altered in the middle lobe, in the middle lobe, if you just see that in the middle part of the lung, 
So this uh, is the same. And this is the, the venul, venular aspect between the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary venu, venual disease, but it is a normal that may be around the point eight. And if you come here in the base of the base of the lung, in the base of the lung, what happens? There is an increased hydrostatic column. Here, the hydrostatic column is at the heart level. It, that means there is no change in the hydrostatic curve. Column. Here, the hydrostatic column is less, there is a negative, there is a compression of the blood vessel. Now, here, there is a distension of the blood vessels. There is no perfusion. If there is more perfusion, the ratio would be lesser. So, with this concept, with this concept, the answer to this question, the ventilation perfusion ratio is maximum at naturally it should be maximum at apex of the lung because here if you are just saying the perfusion is less the ventilation even it is a it's decreased but the ratio becomes more more than one here the ratio is less and here ratio is somewhere around 0.8 and if we are looking at this is exact values here you can just see that we the ventilation perfusion ratio in the apex is about 3.3 here the remaining part are, i have given here the 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 alveolar ventilation is 0.24 liters the flow is 0 0.07 the ratio is 3.3 in the base, you just see that 0.82 is the alveolar dilation, and the, the flow is uh, more, the ratio is uh, less. Ratio is less. This is taken from John West, respiratory physiology. The middle is uh, maybe in between, somewhere around 0.8. This is 3.3 here, so that means it is highest in the, this thing. Answer to the question is the ventilation per year ratio is maximum at apex of the lung, option A. Now, coming back to question number 14, the pacemaker of a respiration where a spontaneous rhythmic respiration initiated is. The pacemaker of a respiration where spontaneous rhythmic respiration initiated is. The spontaneous rhythmic respiration initiated is. The option A, dorsal nuclear group. Option B, apneostic group. Option C, pneumotaxic group. Option D, the pre complex. If you are looking at this uh, particular thing, this uh, dorsal nuclear group is in the medulla. Apneostic is between the medulla and the pontine junction. And the pneumotaxic center is in the pons. The pneumotaxic center controls the apneustic center. The apneustic center, that means it is not rhythmic. It receives inputs from other things, the regular system. The apneustic center receives input from the pneumotaxic centers and other vagal inputs. Both of them, they receive vagal inputs and other reticular inputs, that is parabrachial. So then dorsal nuclear, so they would give to the dorsal nuclear. In the dorsal nuclear, we have the inspiratory center and expiratory center. Of that inspiratory center, it is driven by the ramp generator. Ramp generator, wherein a ramp is generated, the inspiratory centers and expiratory centers are uh, reciprocally, uh, reciprocally um, controlled. So this ramp generator uh, triggers the inspiration. So if you are looking at the ramp generator is located in the uh, pre bootinger complex. Hence, this ramp generator becomes the a pacemaker. Now, the, the correct response for this uh, question is that the pacemaker of respiration is situated where it produces the spontaneous rhythmic activity is situated in the pre ginger complex in the middle. So that is, a, uh, that is the correct response. Option D is the correct response. Now we move on to the question number 15. Uh, again, an easy question. Carbon monoxide poisoning is a type of option A, anemic hypoxia, option B, toxic hypoxia, option C, hypoxic hypoxia, option D, stagnant hypoxia. The carbon monoxide, if you, if you try to look into this thing, carbon monoxide binds with the hemoglobin irreversibly 
and it is uh, the binding is more potent than the oxygen. So that means once it binds with the hemoglobin and it cannot be displaced by the oxygen. Hence, the binding with oxygen is not possible. Now, because of the, that reason, it becomes a sort of an anemic situation. That means the hemoglobin is not able to carry the oxygen. Hemoglobin is not able to carry the oxygen. Hence, it becomes a sort of anemic hypoxia. Histotoxic is a cyanide poisoning or uh, the, uh, the mitochondrial poisons. That is histotoxic hypoxia. Or hypoxic is where the, the partial pressure of the oxygen is lower. So where in, it is, the other things remain same. The hemoglobin and other aspects remain same, but the, the, the PO2, the oxygen tension itself is lower. Stagnant is a slow circulation. So the correct response is uh, anemic hypoxia, and uh, I have not referenced it, and you will get it in many books. The carbon monoxide uh, produces anemic hypoxia. Now, move on to the next question, question number 16, which is true about the juxtamodal medullary nephrons. Which is true about the juxtamodal nephrons accounts for 85% of total nephrons, option A. Length of the loop of Henley is short. So they are using abbreviations and it is not expected in uh, multiple choice questions to use abbreviations because some students may not, it may not strike. It's always better to write the loop of Henley. So anyway, they have done it and I have no control over that. So then the second option C is efferent arteriole forms the rect. Option D, renin content is less. Now let us consider the number of nephrons, the cortical nephrons are more. They constitute about 85%. The, this is a textile medullary nephron. This is a medullary nephron. They only constitute about 15%. The option A is not correct response. And the uh, length of the loop of Henle is short. The length of the loop of Henle is short for the cortical nephrons. But for the, the medullary, just on medullary nephrons, you see that length of the loop of Henle. So it is, it is dipping down deep into the medulla. So that is a longer. It's longer. So that is again not a correct option. B is not a correct response. So now the renin content is less. Yes, renin content is less in the cortical nephrons, whereas it is primarily for controlling this particular aspect, juxtamedullary, whatever the renin content is more here in the juxtamedullary nephrons. So that means it's also not the correct response. The correct response is option C, the efferent arteriole. This is the efferent arteriole becomes a, a, a straight artery dipping down into the middle of forming what is called a vasar rectum. These are vasar rectum. So that means efferent artery will form vasar rectum. This is the correct response. Option C is the correct response. Okay, this, this particular picture, I have taken it from Genong's uh, textbook of physiology, page 642. Now I will move on to question number uh, 17. Substrate, which is both secreted and filtered. So the option A is uric acid. Option B is glucose. Option C is urea. Option D is sodium. So now we have to find a substrate, substrate which is both secreted and filtered. So now, if you are looking at this thing, all are filtered. The uric acid is filtered, glucose is filtered, urea is filtered, the sodium is filtered. So that means all are filtered. Only thing now we have to look into the uh, substrate which is secreted. Looking at the glucose, glucose is not secreted. Glucose is being reabsorbed. So that means it is out of question. Option B is out of question. So now, the, then option C, the urea undergoes a passive change, passive change according to the uh, interstitial and the tubular uh, 
concentrations. There is neither, uh, there is no sort of a, a reabsorption or uh, the secretion. So that means urea is not also correct choice. Because of course the urea undergoes in the proximal convert tubule, it is reabsorbed. Then it comes back in the distal convoluted tubule and it is uh, uh, again enters into the medulla. That means uh, I, I cannot say that means passive movement or it cannot be said secretion. I don't know why even if you are thinking it is a secretion. Yes, the distal convoluted tubule and a collecting duct gives urea because yes, the concentration of urea keeps on uh, increasing in the, in the distal convoluted tubule and uh, collecting duct. Uh, uh, fluid and then in the medulla it is less that moves into the medulla and this forms the second secondary this is responsible for the countercurrent multiplication the first countercurrent multiplication happening because of the uh, sodium um, exchange uh, the exchanger in the which is happening in the uh, sodium chloride to one sodium two chloride uh, exchanger liquidated in the uh, thick ascending limb of loop of Hendler. So now the urea is a passive uh, follower of the whatever the concentrations. Then comes the sodium. If you are looking at the sodium, sodium is being filtered. I said that it is being filtered. And what happens? It is secreted if required, depending upon the plasma sodium concentration. Because if you are depleted, this is hyponatremia. So then sodium is trying to be, uh, so uh, our sodium levels in the plasma uh, dictates whether it is the, uh, it, it goes in this direction or in that direction. So there may be secretion. And again, uh, depending upon the, uh, the H ion or acidosis or alkalosis uh, that uh, sodium undergoes change, the sodium hydrogen exchanger system and the sodium uh, calcium exchanger system or sodium exchange in reference to uh, the aldosterone, aldosterone or mineral corticoid. So that means sodium may have a secretion. I'm not telling. The uric acid, yes, it is secreted in the distal nephron. It is secreted in the distal nephron, but it is being absorbed in the uh, proximal nephron, that is in the PCT. It undergoes all three changes, filter, absorbed, and secreted. So most likely answer to this question from my side is option A, uric acid. I don't know what the NTR university is looking at. And uh, now the, if somebody challenges it, the sodium may also be possible because at times of emergency, at times of the uh, conditions of the plasma sodium level, it may change in the direction. That is one aspect. I'm, I'm going with option A is a correct response. Then comes the question number 18. Water reabsorption that occurs secondary to solute reabsorption. Water reabsorption that occurs secondary to solute reabsorption is called option A, obligatory reabsorption, option B, facultative reabsorption, option C, complementary reabsorption, option D, compulsive reabsorption. Let us understand these terms obligatory. That means it has to oblige oblige a friend. It is obligatory because the friend is moving and I have to oblige. That is obligatory. The facultative, that means somebody has forced, somebody has forced uh, some, some mechanisms have made that uh, reabsorption of water. Facultative reabsorption. Just like a uh, ADH that opens up the Corporeans and then moves the water movement and that is dependent upon the, the medullary concentration. Or complementary. A complementary reabsorption is a term. Uh, it was used for a co-transport mechanism, especially the glucose and uh, uh, the sodium relation. The glucose, the sodium reabsorption, or sodium is going as a complementary in the glucose reabsorption. Or glucose is complementary to sodium reabsorption because the secondary uh, sodium, a secondary transport system, the secondary transport system. So that is a complementary reabsorption. A compulsive reabsorption, uh, I don't know, maybe the terminology is uh, 
maybe some some other place it is it is coming up especially the uh, selective uptake from of the neurotransmitters where uh, compulsion uh, compulsion because of the expression of new proteins that is uh, where it is but whether it is appropriate in the kidney i don't know now looking at this thing the answer to this question is uh, option a obligatory reabsorption is the correct response because the water moves in reference to the solutes which have moved and uh, the water moves along that is a obligatory reabsorption and uh, uh, the faculty to reabsorption happens in the uh, in reference to the other hormones like uh, adh or uh, adrenaline now coming back uh, which part of kidney tubule plays less role in acidification of urine option a pct option b loh option c dct option d collecting that somehow i don't like these uh, abbreviations the proximal convoluted tubule the loop of henle the distal convoluted perhaps uh, for some students it may be a hindering because they may not uh, at the time of examination they may not uh, it may not click what is happening there they may have a thought block it is better to have a full form of the things anyway so they have given this question and we have to accept that now considering this so the what is the question acidification of urine in the proximal convoluted tubule it is the bicarbonate mechanism which is working for the acidification of urine but here the urinary acidification near the end of the proximal uh, convoluted tubule uh the luminal fluid which is isopH it's isopH because uh, whatever the it is because of the carbon dioxide and water because uh, whatever HCO3 is reabsorbed it reacts with the HA ions and then it becomes uh, again carbon dioxide and water so this is isopH so that means urine is not acidified then comes a uh, loop of henle loop of henle is for concentrating mechanism for sodium movement for medullary concentration that is the function of the loop of henle the multiplier system so that may not that may not add for the acidification now in the distal convoluted tubule here comes the because we have exhausted with the almost uh, the the bicarbonates so then we have additional system of uh, exchangers the sodium hydrogen exchangers and the uh, and the potassium hydrogen exchangers and the distal convoluted tubule uh, through the aldosterone mechanism they, they may be happening and the h ions or uh, uh, re, the being reabsorbed or uh, being secreted being secreted here in this thing and these are uh, buffered by the phosphate buffer then here comes the what what we call as a titratable acidity so that means acidification of urine titratable acidity begins here with the dct then comes in the collecting duct in the dct and the collecting duct uh, where ammonia mechanism also glutaminase activity and ammonia formation that would also form the uh, the for the h ion the, that will also exchange for the h ion and that is again another acidifying agent so we have the dct and the collecting duct phosphate and uh, acidification uh, ammonia mechanisms they would participate in the uh, acidification flowing and now so now what is the thing which of the part which part of the tubule plays a less role in acidification of urine i would uh, go for uh, loop of henle the option uh, response is option b loop of henle now i have substantiated this thing with uh, the genomics review of medical physiology on page 680 and on page 686 if you go back and refer so you will get this response or you will get that uh, dct collecting that the dct uh, they how they participate in the uh, yeah, hydrogen ion or the acidification the answer is option b loop of henle then question number 20 the question number 20 is a sort of a neurological question the spastic neurogenic bladder is seen in spastic neurogenic bladder is seen in a spinal cord transection 
B, de-apprentiation. Option C, denervation. Option D, ladder tumor. Now, the spinal cord section, if you are looking at, so just I have explained here, we have to specify the stage of spinal cord section. During the spinal shock, there is what are called what is called an overflow incontinence because uh, the the there is a failure of the autonomic system and the, the sphincter centricity remain contracted and once the uh, the bladder pressure increases then overflow incontinence begins. That is the spinal shock. That is why catheterization is must at that point in time. Then after recovering from the spinal shock. What happens? We will get to that spastic. So what what we call as a uh, spastic neurogenic bladder, where widening reflex is hyperactive. The, you get the mass mass reflex. Sometimes the patients uh, try to um, touch the perineal area and the inner side of the thigh and to initiate the reflex mechanism, uh, the reflex uh, widening of the bladder. So that is how they, they use that mass reflex mechanism and uh, the widening reflex become hyperactive and the bladder capacity is decreased. So bladder capacity is uh, almost it is a spastic or in a contracted state. It's in a contracted state and the wall gets hypertrophic because of the increased uh, reflex. If you are uh, looking at uh, another interesting feature, uh, the after the spinal shock, the below the level of the lesion, if we will get a uh, upper motor neuron type of uh, activity and that goes with the spastic uh, type of uh, paralysis. So we can, we can just try to uh, bring about that. That's after, that means the spinal cord section will have this uh, spastic neurogenic pattern. Okay, now look into the de-apprentiation the apprentiation that happens in case of tapes dorsalis where afferents are not reaching. In that case, the, the reflexes are not initiated. The bladder become full. The walls become thin because they are not responding and they, they may rupture because of the continuous stretch on the, the bladder. Uh, this is a hypotonic thin. Then in case of the Denervation, as happens in case of a cauda equina syndrome, cauda equina syndrome. In that case, the bladder becomes decentralized because it is the efferents are not connected. Efferents, that is the, the uh, sacral sacral components are not coming. That means uh, yes, yes, for that minerva origin is and the, the sacral supply of the sacra, the sphincter sacra is missing. In that case, uh, the these the bladder become not centralized. It becomes automatic. It will just when once it is filled and it tries to empty, just like the overflow of the continents, so it tries to empty. Then bladder tumor, we have to think which side the tumor is located, where it is located, how big is the tumor, and other tumor morphology is an important aspect. So that may have alteration in the thing, and that will not produce the spastic uh, thing. The correct response to this uh, spastic neurogenic bladder is uh, option A, the spinal cord trans transaction, perhaps uh, I, would, uh, I would love to add spinal cord section, after spinal shock, after recovery from spinal shock, that would that would be the more appropriate uh, response. Okay, you can find this thing in uh, uh, these things are discussed in uh, page six six sixty two of the Genomics Review. Okay, so hope uh, you like the discussion, and um, if you if you like to add uh, more such questions to be discussed, please feel free to add these questions in the box so that I can work on them and I can try to provide the more information. Uh, thank you very much. I would, I would like that you please subscribe to my channel so that you will be updated with the new um, uploads I am making in my channel. And uh, 
certainly leave your comments in the box. Thank you once again.